At this point in the video, you might be a little concerned. I live in a rental, so I can't be bolting anything to the concrete floor. Thanks, I hate it. Welcome back to Build Theory, where I show you my build process in order to encourage and enable your own projects. I put a 12 valve Cummins in an Explorer and it's getting close to where I can drive it. I really wanna get this thing out the door, go for a test drive. However, there's still something that it needs before I get it to that point. Like for example, the front shock is sitting right here. This needs to be in the car. I can't drive it if the front end's doing this. Bounce, 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 bounce. I gotta damp that. You can see though, this is a pretty tall front shock that I have and it doesn't fit on the stock suspension. I mean, nothing about the suspension stock anymore, but you know what I mean. Despite what the YouTube comment section wants me to do, this thing has TTB underneath it. I actually put the TTB under it from a three quarter ton F250, which was very cheap for a three quarter ton front end, about $200. I personally like TTB. I think they're a jack of all trades, do it all kind of axle. Solid axles don't like going fast for the most part. And then while I do plan on rock crawling in this thing, I don't live in Moab. So I want this thing to also ride nice and I want it to also be able to go fast off road, not just rock crawl. So in today's video, I'm gonna finish getting the TTB set up in this thing. And by the end, I'm hoping I can show you that it's not as bad as you might think it is. I think I'm gonna get quite a bit of travel out of this. And for the most part, other than having an axle swap, it's a stock like front end. Lift springs, some tall shocks, and let's see how much flex we can actually get out of this. It's probably gonna be more than you think. Let's get to work. I purchased these lift shocks for an F250. Not only do they have a lot more damping, which will help with the heavy Cummins engine, they also have about a 10 inch stroke, which will give me way more travel and off-road goodness. However, since they're so large, I'm gonna have to extend my top shock mount by about six inches. The simplest way I could think to do this was just to cut out six inch sections of square tubing and then weld that on. This is just a shock, there's no spring, so it doesn't need to be as strong as a coilover mount would need to be. And besides, this is just pure tension and compression. There is no bending. Square tubing is actually pretty good with these loading cases. Let's give this a try and see how it turns out. Thanks, I hate it. This thing is ugly, it doesn't quite fit. Not a fan of it, we're getting rid of it. Say goodbye to three or four days work. At this point in the video, you might be a little concerned. That's understandable, but I swear I have a plan. And my plan involves these. I ordered this JD squared two bender quite a long time ago. With the way the world is right now, it took quite a long time to come in, but it finally came in. So I ran down and grabbed some round tubing and I'm just gonna make these shop mounts out of round tubing. I wish this had come in earlier before I had started making them out of square tubing. It didn't, so. Time to remake them. The square tubing would have been fine, but the tolerances were a little too tight. I just wasn't perfectly happy with it. I thought it was ugly. Round tubing is way prettier. So this is a good excuse to try this thing out anyways. I've never really worked with tubing a whole ton, so let's see how it turns out. I'm probably gonna get some comments on this, so I figured I'd mention how I did it. Most people mount these things on a stand that bolts to the floor. I live in a rental, so I can't be bolting anything to the concrete floor. So what I did is I bolted it to my pallet rack. This is the heaviest thing in my garage, so I figured if I can't bolt it to the floor, bolting it to the pallet rack is the best thing to bolt it to. There is plenty of ballast on this pallet rack to hold this thing down. So this is one and three quarter, 95 wall thickness, and that is pretty hard to bend on that tube bender. I need an extended handle or something for that because that was a workout, but obviously doable. This is what I ended up with for my bend. It's almost 90 degrees, it's not quite 90 degrees. The thing about steel is that it's very springy, that's why we use it for things like springs. So when you're bending, you don't go to 90, you go a little bit past 90, because when you let off, it springs back. So if you go all the way to 90 and then let off, it'll spring open a little. I went to about 93 degrees on that bender's gauge. It still wasn't quite enough. I should have gone to 95 or 96 on the gauge. Doesn't matter for what I'm doing now. In the future, just keep in mind, spring back's a thing. Six degrees sounds like a lot of spring back to me. So it's possible that I didn't zero the gauge right, but it won't matter for what I'm doing. When I weld it on, I can weld it on at whatever angle I want. So this doesn't actually need to be 90. In the future, it's good to know though. Just to build it overkill and because I can, I'm gonna reinforce this section here so that when my shock is pushing on this end, it doesn't bend the thing. Let's get to work. 
I wanted to add a couple center lines 180 degrees apart on this tube. This will really help when I do the tube notching to make sure that the tube notches actually line up. I just measured halfway up the diameter of the tube and then clamped a sharpie to the bench, lined that sharpie up to the halfway mark, and moved the pipe along the sharpie making sure not to roll it as I did so. This gave me close enough two center lines. fit up on this actually turned out amazing for me. Almost no gap the whole way around. I usually can't get a fit up that good. Let me show you the trick I just used to get it there. I knew I couldn't trust the angle on this gauge because I knew the angle on the 90 wasn't actually 90. So rather than trying to trust the gauge, all I did was I notched out the one and then I put the 90 up against it to make sure that this notcher was parallel to this, which means not 45 degrees, but whatever half of whatever this angle was. So then as long as you get the rotation angle in here correct and you get the angle on here correct, this will come out perfect. Those are the two angles you need. Seems like a simple tip, wasn't obvious to me the first time. Well, that's certainly much nicer looking. That looks way better than this. I'm pretty happy with that. Unfortunately, I did drop this upper bushing up here and I haven't been able to find it. Hopefully it'll show up when I'm cleaning the shop floor. Well, I'm certainly much happier with that. It's way stronger too. I did the finite element analysis. This will handle at least 2000 pounds, which is way overbuilt for what it's doing. It's only holding a shock. It doesn't even have a spring on it. I would show you the FEA, but I may or may not have done it during a uh, very long virtual meeting at work. So I'm gonna have it on my home computer, but that is much prettier, much stronger, and I'm way more happy with it. You might be wondering why it's kind of shaped how it is. Is. Why didn't I just do a full hoop all the way across and let me show you as you can see this side has a load of stuff in the way There is a power steering pump right here. There's steering shafts. There are brake lines coming up I did not have room to do a full hoop In fact, I barely had room to do what I did if you look here You can see I had to bash and cut a little bit to even get this shock mount to fit and that's as tight a radius and everything as my bender will do Stuff was really tight here. Even the shock to the spring distance was pretty tight So this was actually really difficult to get this fit in here, but it worked out and I'm happy with it. Now it's time to answer the question we've all been waiting for. How much flex does this have? Keep in mind, I may have done an axle swap, but this suspension is near stock. It's about what you would have if all you did was throw some lift springs and some lift shocks on your ride. The only other thing I did is extend the radius arm. So this is a reasonably mild build anyone can do. Let's see how much travel I get out of it. I'm gonna check the travel on this side, which is the driver's side. And the reason why is because the driver member is a little shorter, so this is the worst case. And on top of that, it'll give me a good opportunity to check the lengths for my front drive shaft anyways. I already have measurements, but this will let me verify that they're gonna work out. This Explorer is too tall to flex out in my garage. I don't have the stuff to lift it that high, and my ceiling is probably a little too low. So the first thing I'll have to do is remove the tire and the spring on the driver's side. Chain's loose, that's full droop. Top of that to some arbitrary point on the chassis, 36 inches. All right, let's see what full bump looks like. In order to do full bump, I'm gonna pull the spring out. I don't wanna try to jack all this weight up and compress the spring at the same time. A lot safer if I just pull the spring out. Twenty-two. 
All right, the difference between the two measurements I just took was 14 inches. So that's what I've got in suspension travel on as a worst case, 14 inches. Now, if you look, I still have a couple inches of shock sticking out and that couple inches of shock would translate to three or four inches of suspension travel. So I could maybe be all the way up at like 18 inches. However, the shock is running into the mount there slightly. So that's something I need to look at. Maybe I can add some spacers to the shock or maybe I can grind down the mount a little bit and then I should be able to get any even more. But for now, I'm sitting at 14 inches. I think I could get another three or four inches. I still have a tiny bit of room on that bump. I think I figured out how I'm gonna fix this. I've got enough room in this plate that I can just drill another hole for the mount a little bit further back. That'll move this away from that shock mount at the bottom and that should give me back my travel. There are a million little tweaks I had to make to this suspension that don't make it into the videos. We can't make them a few hours long. I've spent weeks just doing these front shock mounts at this point. I could fix that right now, remeasure the suspension, make sure I have a really solid suspension travel number for YouTube so that nobody laughs at my TTB in the comment section. But. It's late on a Sunday. I don't really feel like doing that. When you watch my videos of me doing this, the impression I want you to walk away with isn't that this is easy. It's certainly not easy to put three quarter ton suspension in a tiny little Explorer. It's certainly not easy to put a 1200 pound Cummins engine in this little Explorer. But the impression that I want you to walk away with is that one, it's doable, and two, it's worth it. This stuff is hard, but it's certainly not magic. You can figure it out. But here's the exciting thing. In its current state, it's almost drivable. I know I've been saying that for a minute, but I don't think there's any reason that in the next video, I can't take care of all the rest of the really small things this thing needs in order to go for a test drive up and down the street. Now, I don't think it's gonna be road legal in the next video. There's still some body work and stuff that needs done, but at the very least, I'm hoping I can take it for a test drive. If that's something that interests you, then subscribe and stick around. Go challenge yourself. Get out there and build something. Hope to see you next time.